unlike George Santos, he actually did work at Goldman Sachs. And I think he was there for some unbelievable 21 year run or something uh, where most people would be in the South of France, just, you know, picking their own, making their own wine. He decided to start a venture capital fund, something in 2008, John, when, when did he start FF? No, that that's correct. That that's a pretty good recap in there, though. I honestly think any sentence that has your name and George Santos in it is probably not a good sentence. But okay. yes, I was at Goldman for twenty one years and then uh, founded FF Venture Capital. Okay, so the, the VC is someone who goes fundraising, who every now and then gets a chance to invest in a company. So it, it, when a lot of people ask me if they should raise a VC fund, people I know. My general advice is don't. Hello, and welcome to Fireside with VC. My name is Andrew Romans, and I'm very excited to be sitting with John Frankel today. John has really been a bit of a mentor to me because he started his VC fund, uh, I would say from scratch, and then built it up. And occasionally I speak to him throughout the year and always get an interesting nugget of advice, which uh, becomes unforgettable for me. So real fast, um, John Frankel, founder of FF Venture Capital. And I believe he, after getting a master's from University of Oxford, which I used to enjoy speaking at occasionally myself, in my old London days, he managed to get into, I think, Arthur Anderson. And so he actually understands a balance sheet and an income statement, probably more than some freshly minted VCs. And um, Unlike George Santos, he actually did work at Goldman Sachs, and I think he was there for some unbelievable 21-year run or something, uh, where most people would be in the south of France, just you know, picking their own, making their own wine. He decided to start a venture capital fund, something in 2008. John, when when did you start FF? No, that that's correct. That, that's a pretty good recap in there. Though I honestly think any sentence that has your name and George Santos in it. It's probably not a good sentence, but okay. yes, I was at Goldman for 21 years and then uh, founded FF Venture Capital. Okay, so if we figure out how to edit videos, maybe, maybe we'll take it out, but I love it. So anyway, um, yeah, so, so I want to talk about all the stuff of founding a fund, building it, and all the success you've had. Uh, but before we get into it, a quick word from Mark on Venture Debt. Hi, everybody. This is Mark Dittarjani. I'm with Pacific Western Bank, and we are a bank focused on helping startups grow and get to the next stage. We've been working with Andrew and 7BC for years now. Andrew and I go back a decade and a half at this point, and I've always respected the fact that he's a thought leader in the space and somebody that you can learn an awful lot. And he kind of opens up that window a little bit into VC and what's what's happening in the back room. So we're excited. Excited to be partnered with Andrew on his podcast here at Pacific Western Bank. We focus on helping startups get to the next level. We offer a startup services program for companies that are the pre-A, which includes some free banking and some high yield interest rates. And then when companies raise an A round, then we start moving into treasury management services and then venture debt. And we believe that we're one of the leaders in the venture debt market because we are flexible and we can do custom packages, and we don't just do off-the-shelf type of term sheets. So enjoy the podcast. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to learn some things, and we'll see you on the other side. Thanks, Mark. And anybody who needs an introduction, happy to share your information with them. Just get in touch with me, and I'll put you in touch with Mark. Thanks so much for supporting and sponsoring the pod. Okay. So, John, tell us tell us some um, a little bit about your pre-FF experience and what did you learn that um, has helped you build FF into a great venture capital franchise? So I, I was fortunate at Goldman that I did about a dozen jobs from helping build various businesses there, including um, Global Custody, um, uh, Prime Brokerage, um, helping operations get a really sort of strong business perspective, what they do to my last 11 years on the sales and trading floor in this role, that's uh, an equity research salesperson. Now, for those who don't know what that is, and maybe that role doesn't exist anymore because wall street changes over time, your job was to understand every single sector that Goldman covered. So from healthcare to retail to banking, insurance, brokerage, um, 
uh, commodities, metals, every single sector and pretty much every product. And whenever someone at Goldman talked about those, if you felt it was important for the clients you covered, and I cover people um, who, who ran large macro hedge funds, folks like Stan Druckermiller um, uh, and the like, um, was to sort of distill this huge fire hose of research coming out of Goldman to the two or three points you wanted to talk to customer about to help them solve their problems, which is managing the money they had at their disposal. And so that that job was a generalist job. You had to quickly understand and grok a subject, pull it together, and really get a sense as to whether that was good or bad for the stock and what can happen. And so it, the, there was this real necessity to process a large amount of information across many sectors and um, filter out all the noise and find the value that you see in that. And so to me as a venture capitalist, when I sit down with an entrepreneur who comes in and says, they're looking to do X. I've got this broad experience behind me and this tool set to either understand what they're doing or ask the questions to understand what they're doing. Okay. So that, that, that sort of generalist training, I think, was very, very helpful. And then combined with the fact that Goldman helped build a number of businesses and have built a couple of businesses since, whilst the Goldman um, has been very helpful as well. So I've got yeah. this unique or unusual balance of both a financial services background, portfolio construction, investing, as well as operational. Okay. And it's getting harder to quickly talk about FF Venture Capital because you've launched funds in Poland and Ukraine. And I'm sure that it's different than the good old New York City strategy that, that you know was once FF. But maybe describe describe in general where what is your geography stage sector? And what are I know you're somewhat broad, but you've got a few core investment themes that you're most interested in, passionate about. Maybe well, over, so over the last 15 years, we've had core US funds. Uh, we closed our sixth fund recently. We'll be raising our seventh fund probably later this year. Okay. And that is primarily focused on businesses that are selling into the US. Right. We opened an office about four years ago in Warsaw, and we have a uh, Polish-based fund focused on the tech and gaming sector. Uh, and, and that fund is doing great. Um, and, the, and what we bring to the table is we're a bridge for those companies into the US. Yeah. Because the markets out there just aren't big enough to build a very large business. And that so that bridge dynamic really came into play um, about a year ago, a little less than a year ago, when one of our partners in Warsaw said we should go and launch a Ukraine fund. And um, you know, we're targeting 50 million. We're looking to get uh, the paperwork, which is voluminous, uh, done and out the way over the next few weeks. But uh, at 50 million, this would not only be the largest fund focused on Ukraine, um, but as far as we know, the only U.S. fund focused on Ukraine. And we, we see this fund as a sort of triple bottom line in yeah. that there's, there's a dearth of capital focused on Ukraine founders. Um, there's a withdrawal of capital uh, from the Russian side. Uh, and so that's creating tremendous value for our LPs. It's creating tremendous value for the companies. Uh, we also have this bridge into the U.S. market and then, you know, the third bottom line is it's just good. Oh, of course. Um, you, you know, it's it's a good cause and it's a good way for us to spend our intellectual capital to help with the eventual sort of rebuilding uh, of Ukraine, which this will be a small part of. Yeah. I wasn't surprised when I saw the announcement because um, we I've been to Warsaw and Krakow many times. And we have LPs that are just family offices from there that made their, made their money in real estate or tech. And so 
and, and I started noticing startups that we were investing in had their engineering teams in Poland. And you, you historically think of, you know, Ukraine is a big outsource engineering place or engineers there. But I started seeing Poland come up and up and up and up. And then I was approached by PFR and right. the Polish Development Fund. And they were basically saying, I think they were willing to go as high as 50%, that they were willing to put up 50% if we could raise matching. And we thought about doing it. And then in the end, we thought it was, you know, distracting from our, our U.S. focus. But um, did did you, you know, what, I mean, we don't have to disclose this and I can edit this out, but is P, PFR, is that one of your anchor LPs? In oh, P, PFR is a good partner there. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people are scared because of the bureaucracy and the like. Um, we've generally found government agencies to be great partners. Yeah. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we've managed money for the Empire State Development Fund. Um, we also manage money for New Jersey Economic Development Agency. I, we think these are good. Um, uh, they're good. Firstly, they're great people to work with, but they're they're sort of good agencies and good cause. And I think it's incumbent upon. Um, uh, venture funds to see the to put up with what may be a different way, a um, some more bureaucracy, a couple of sort of strictures around how you invest to work with these folks because you know this is people's tax dollars at work, and you want mm -hmm. the people who are helping put that money to work to be you know good folks in the industry, not um. Uh, not the folks who can't raise money elsewhere. And yeah. so, you know, I, our sense is it's it's just part of giving back, part of public good to do it. And um, and again, you know, the people who do this are great people and we enjoy working with them. So we've worked with PFR, we've worked with other agencies, we expect to work with others in the future um, uh, because they're good causes. And we want to I mean, it makes, it makes so much sense that all I can say is it's flawed at how these programs are not bigger. If you look at British Business Bank, you look at BPI France, look at PFR there, Israelis kind of made the model. But um, if, if, if the government of the United States or any country is even 30% of the LP base, but they've got a monopoly on payroll tax and, the, and then startups get funded, have... 24 18 month runways to go and hire people they're getting all of that payroll tax they're getting the multiplier on the on the economy of somebody gets a hundred thousand salary and they spend that money and there's tax everywhere there's a multiplier effect on it um and it's job creation it's where the value is it's transforming your engineers making code for twitter to engineers that own equity and can become Jack Dorsey. So it's just no, no, such I'm a no-brainer. It's it's no brainer, but but you have to do it in a way that you're also looking to make money. And oh, you yeah. have to well, make that's part sure of the too. vehicle, you know, allows um the the capitalist dynamic as well as the social good dynamic to be resolved. Yeah. And we, we found we've been able to reconcile those in very good ways. In fact, we think our fund for NJEDA, I'm uh, sorry. I apologize uh, for uh, Empire State Development Fund, um, which we had as a as a sidecar fund, is probably one of the best performing funds in the country. Um, so you certainly can uh, generate strong economic uh, returns for these agencies as well. Yeah, I mean, better than you know your tax dollars going to an aircraft carrier. That's the first thing to get sunk by a sub. At least this stuff is an evergreen generating profit center. If it's done properly, so, so that makes sense. And so, with with F for the U.S. vehicles, and you're going into Fund Seven now. Um, I know you guys are big New York City investors, but are you investing out? You're investing outside the tri-state area, or what is the geographical? So, 15 years ago, when we got started, I would say we were a third West Coast, a third New York, and a third everywhere else. Yeah. Um, so we've invested in many different states. We have some Israeli uh, companies that are focused on the U.S., some Canadian companies that are focused on the U.S. W what I will tell you is California has probably come down a little as a percentage, probably down to 15 to 20%. And New York has grown as a percentage. 
Okay. So 15 years ago, New York was an also ran center. Today, it's you know one of the two dominant ones in the U.S. Yeah, and there's a lot of reasons for that that I could go into, but that growth really has meant for us there are a lot more interesting companies in New York than there used to be. So, you know, we 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 how do I put this? this we used to say that some VCs only want to invest in companies that are one Tesla charge away from their office. Uh, yeah, and the 30 minute rule is what I call that. Yeah, yeah. We we found no correlation between return and where the office is. And obviously post pandemic, the you know, it's even difficult to say where some companies are headquartered now. Um no, we've seen so geography is not a boundary to us. In fact, that was in part why we went to look at Europe and ended up in Warsaw. We felt there was a real opportunity uh, to professionalize seed stage uh, in Europe. And, um, you know, what I get from a lot of VCs, they go, why Warsaw? With like, they, they just don't understand it, which I love that question. Because, you know, our investment in Warsaw and in Poland is part of a five to 10 year plan. And I hope at some point someone will go, Oh, well, that was obvious. Well, because, I, I, it's because very obvious to me. Because, it kind of is. I mean, there was like MCI management was the only VC in that entire country. And a buddy of mine, Sylvester, left there and he got PFR as an anchor. And I think he even got EIF. Like normally you don't have government matching government. But he, had, hmm. he had EIF in for basically 50 and PFR for 50. And then he had a handful of you know, Robert Lugowski's Coben Angels came in, but, you know, for non-meaningful amounts, but probably huge value add and mm -hmm. got that first fund up and running. Um, and I think, you know, you don't want to just be uh, getting paid by the hour, making someone else's code. At some point you want to productize. And I, I would imagine it's like Israel, the Israeli home market as a population of like going from five to 11 million people or wherever it is, is, is not even a Petri dish. It's always been we have to win the US to win the world. And we're, and then, you know, you have these bridges of somebody moves to the Valley, raises money from Sequoia, sells their company to Google. Then they go home, make some seed investments, and they can introduce those entrepreneurs to you and me and everybody else they know. And it you know, becomes that bridge. So I think that Poland is, you know, they, they, they also suffered from being in between Germany and Russia for centuries. And then, then they started benefiting from that location. Um, and then, and I think that is our Polish LPs, they saw the cars on the streets of Warsaw with Russian plates, Ukrainian plates, with everybody running. So they know about Ukraine better than anybody. You know, they were sleeping in law firms, these, you know, refugees and technology refugees. So I wasn't surprised at all. And, and I think that, you know, you got to, you know, you want to give a man a fish, not a fishing rod, not a fish. And so what you're doing in Ukraine is incredibly important, you know, I think. So I'm pretty, I'm really happy you did that. Can you disclose a little bit about what the process was like? I mean, were people a little paranoid about investing in a region that was having their power grid attacked? You know, I, I think, so, so to be clear, our Ukraine fund is focused on Ukraine founders, whether they're today in Ukraine or not. Uh, right. We have, you know, we have uh, portfolio companies that have folks in Ukraine, um, and we have one that is majority of the people there today. And they're actually going gangbusters. They're in uh, cloned voice or deepfake audio space called Respecha. Um, they've won a number of Emmys, Golden Globe, uh, oh, wow. just just phenomenal work. Um, uh, but yeah, it's. The fundraising for this fund actually has been one of the easiest funds to fundraise for. Really? Because when you go in the room and you tell people you're doing this, they either get it or they don't. And if they get it, they go, where do I send the check? Yeah. Like, pe people understand that there's a dearth of capital. They can make high returns that you're investing at a time of duress, which is a great time to be putting capital to work, that, and you're getting the benefit of, this is something I can do. Yeah. Right? You can always cut a check to a charity. You may or may not have a good understanding where that goes, but this you really know. 
Yeah. Uh, and this is not a charity. The, you know, this is a full economic concern um, that has the benefit of also just helping um, helping out Ukraine founders to get funding to do what they need to do. Yeah, I mean, employing Ukrainian refugees outside of Ukraine or in Ukraine doing tech dev work, such a no brainer. I mean, they've had companies, I think Grammarly isn't, I mean, you would know, isn't Grammarly a Ukrainian born company? It, 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 it is. It's one of their unicorns. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, as it should be. Fantastic. So maybe, John, if there's VCs listening to this or people planning on starting a first fund, second fund, third fund, maybe give us some advice. What, what, I remember, you know, I think you were at our Christmas party or our holiday party in New York and you said, um, Andrew, enjoy raising fund two because that'll be hopefully easier for you than fund one, but get ready for fund three. That's the hard one. Like, and, and, uh, and it certainly was, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you raise money from everybody, you know, and they're ready to back you. Then they maybe back you again on fund two. And then unless you're selling something on the secondary market, moving DPI a bit faster, you know, people get a little, uh, exhausted or something. Uh, a good friend of mine, Louis Gersh, um, once said to me that the VC is someone who goes fundraising, who every now and then gets a chance to invest in a company. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Don't tell people the truth about company. it. Don't tell anyone the truth. That... So it, it, when a lot of people ask me if they should raise a VC fund, people I know, my general advice is don't. Oh, yeah. Me too. Because... <laughs> You're making a 20-year commitment, which is a long time. Remember, the average marriage in this country lasts seven years. So you're making a 20-year. And the reason why you're making a 20-year commitment is you're committing not only to the first fund, probably to the second, the third, and the fourth, by which point you're a decade in, and that needs to run off over another decade. Yeah, These funds take a long time to mature c stage funds take a long time because you're investing right at the beginning of life of a company the normal survival stats for companies is if you have a hundred at the seed stage which pulled out a sub five million dollar check or round rather sub five million dollar round generally they're two to three million dollar rounds so if there's a hundred companies to get funded there and by the way that's a fraction of the companies that actually are looking for funding, but if a hundred get funded at the seed level, 30 raise a series A, 10 raise a series B, one goes public. So that's so you've got an enormous drop-off curve, and people will respond to it differently. Um, you know, we, we try to fight that curve, and so we have higher survivorship for A and B, about half our seed funding companies get to B. But you know, another way to look at that is if if one percent go public, um, probably about one percent get to a hundred million revenue run rate. We don't really know. I've heard, I've seen estimates of one percent of SaaS companies doing that. Um, we're running at about ten percent. So so our model is designed for survivorship, but. In reality, as a VC, you've got this portfolio. How are you going to focus on it? How are you going to do work? Are you going to follow rounds? You're going to lead rounds. You're going to sit on boards. You're going to be in the board observer. You're not going to be in the boardroom at all. How do you keep an edge in understanding the company? How do you help the company to to change that? And that work happens all after the point of raising the money and cutting that first check. There's years and years of work. Yeah. And then, you know, you, as you get distributions, you then have to go and open up your LPA, your, you know, limited partner agreement, and see how you actually agreed when you raise the fund to sort of split up the proceeds and the profits all the way to when you wind up the fund at the end. There's just a lot of work. There's yeah. a lot of numbers, a lot of reporting, a lot of accounting. A lot of fiduciary responsibility. And so, you know, I say to people, are you sure you want to run that business? Because it's not yeah. just cutting checks and ringing the bell. Yeah, There's I mean, a lot yeah. of stuff you in know, between. I mean, also dealing dealing with, so constantly raising, 
uh, constantly dealing with inbound. I mean, in, in places like San Francisco, I got pitched during T- in a TSA clear line. You know, so th- do you really want that lifestyle of people chasing you to your car after you spoke at some event and, you know, and all, all that stuff? I think the somebody beat into me very early, um, Jack Tankerslave from Meritage Funds, and he was ex Centennial in Colorado, old telecom guy saying, um, best of breed reporting. Reporting is so important. And he really pounded into me about reporting, reporting, reporting. And I find that if you're, whenever I get in the car, I call one of my CEOs. I'm like, who am I going to call? And by by calling, by doing the reporting really consistently, it forces communication with the company, which results in value delivery to the company or making sure they don't run out of cash. I mean, if nothing else, don't run out of cash. And so constantly... So it's the, I think the reporting leads to being a value-added investor. That's the way I've kind of thought about it. But you're certainly right. When um, That's why I was joking that said if 21 years at Goldman Sachs and then you signed up for what's really not 20 years. I mean, I think it's more than 20-year commitment. Um, you know, you just hope you can g- keep going like Alan Patrickoff into his late 80s. Um, but it's certainly a lot of work. So on on on. Uh, talk about on your first fund, did you manage to get institutional LPs into a fund one with your no, no. background? So, so, uh, so describe so what, I, was the, I, what kind I, of investors did you get into fund one? Uh, friends and family. So, but I want, I want to be clear. Uh, it was 2008. I left Goldman in February and I said, I'm going to spend six months doing nothing, just clearing my head. After five months, I found myself in the lawyer's office drafting up documents to create a venture fund. Lehman blows up. And I'm just going to people saying, I'm looking for like 10-year illiquid money, and everyone's rushing to money markets. And then they go, hold on, money markets has asset-backed commercial paper. You know, what is that? Where's my money? Like everyone was getting very holding their money close. So we were targeting a $25 million fund. We ended up raising uh, about $8 million, which is enough to hang a shingle. And then two years later, we raised a $27 million fund. And then we sort of took it from there. Um, but yeah, they, the first place you go are the people who are going to say, I'll give you money and I'll trust you. They, there's, there's, there's a so like uh, a phrase within venture that it costs about 20 to 30 million dollars for someone to become a venture capitalist and what they mean is someone has to have a lot of mistakes along the way (laughs) to like sort out and and know what to do i don't know if i subscribe to that fully but there is a sense when someone sets up a first fund that people will give them money they want the financial returns and they like the person but there's a lot of personal relationship in that. The second fund then becomes friends of friends and friends of family. Mm-hmm. Because if you start with a C stage fund, you're going to have no exits in a couple of years. Maybe you have one, but that'll be unusual. And so it's a long slog because you're dealing with this really a liquid part of the stack within private equity, even within venture. Um, because it's the earliest part. And if companies are going to do really well, they need time. Whatever, if they're compounding 100% a year, 200, 300% a year in the first couple of years, it still takes time to get to 50 million, 100 million of revenue. Um, And and during that period, you're convincing people that that you've put the right process, you've got the right strategy, you've got the right team uh, in place. Uh, for them to give you capital. So all of these things just take, they, it just takes time. Um, yeah. And maybe um, talk a little bit about portfolio construction. So on on those early funds or your US, let's talk the, the US funds. Um, I mean, I, I, we co-invested on some deals. So I've seen you in pretty early stage, um, you know, but, but what is your, how many companies per fund? What percentage is going to what stage? So our, our model 
is a little different than, than other folks. Most funds run for every dollar for initial check, they reserve one dollar. We look to across the fund reserve two to three dollars. We like to start that C stage three to seven hundred thousand per ten percent of a company. We then follow on deeply up to a fifty million dollar valuation and stop. We do that because if you carry on investing at 100, at 200, at 500 million, how do you move a fund other than cutting a big check? If you cut a big check, you know, you cut a $4 million check so you can move the fund. If that company doesn't work out, you've now put a big sinker on the fund. So our, our model is to have funds that will never have a negative return on capital to LPs um, and ones where um, the winners, we can be up 50 times, 100 times, 150 times, which provides a lot of insulation for the beta that comes into companies in later stages. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're up 100 yeah. times and the company is down 70%. Uh, you're still up 30 times. Yeah, I think of it as like if you and I had a $1 billion fund that we raise every two or three years and we 2x the fund, that's $200 million at carry split two ways or three ways over, right. you know, once that flywheel catches up. And so those guys are happy to write a $50, $100 million check if they think it's going to 2x within a year or if it drags on three or four years, it might get to a 4x because it was a big fund to begin with. I think when you have smaller funds like you and I, we're, we're, we're not, you don't want to use fund treasure to be in a 2X opportunity or a 4X opportunity. When you're investing in, you're saying up to 50 million in valuation, there's some wisdom to that, that, you know, there's still a lot of folks that could buy that company at 50 or the multiple you're going to get is still high. Do you do you guys have a framework that says if we don't think a 10x return is possible, then we would not invest? Or is it right. a we, we we want for our initial checks, we want to invest in opportunity to think and get to 100 million revenue run rate. Now okay. we're often wrong, but we seem to be right about 10% of the time. Okay. And if it can get to 100 million revenue run rate, it should be able to get to you know an IPO or a meaningful MA. Right. So, so that that's kind of our objective. And if if you think about it, remember I said of a hundred companies, 30 raise an A, 10 raise a B, one goes public. Another way to look at that is in VC portfolios, only about a third of the companies you invest in generate a decent return. A third go to zero, a third you wish you hadn't invested in because they don't, but the last third. Are ones where it's interesting. It's only a third or a third, a third of that third or ten percent of your portfolio that are your real winners. And so yeah. people approach that differently. Some people say, "I'm too busy as a VC because, as you know, there's a lot of things we end up doing." And so if a company calls you up and they have a problem, I put them into the third that failed or the third that's boring, right? And the ones that are doing well, that's where I'm going to spend all my time. You know, I, and that's I, that's a natural sense. We take a different response, which is if a company is failing, is it failing because they're not accountants? They don't know, you know, they've mismanaged something, they tripped over their shoelaces, or is it failing because our original thesis is wrong? If our thesis is wrong, we're wrong, and that's fine, and we step back. But if we think that this company still has real potential, we will tend to step up with time and resources and capital to help them move them along. And so historically, we've had about 20% of our portfolio fail. Yeah. Um, but we'll have to see. Like, I only have 15 years of data. Yeah, it's it, This is a very yeah. long tail business. Yeah. Um, but, but to us, if we can take one that was going to fail and turn it into a company that could return the fund, that's a meaningful move to returns over time. Yeah, I, I was going to say that at first I was going to say we do the opposite. If you're spending all your time on your winners and not your time on your losers, I find it's my, you know, when, when I'm in the car and I'm calling these guys and I'm, you know, finding out what is going on. I'm like, whoa, 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 what happened? We had a 18 month or 24 month runway. How is it possible you're running out of cash here? And 
then I will not be absent at all. We'll be very involved in, you know, disaster recovery situations of right. the, the, the hardest ones and the ones that are just, you know, doing great. I'm like, all right, great. Well, uh, who can we introduce you to for the next funding round? Um, and, and the amount of intense time of like talking them off the ledge of giving up <laughs> or something, you know, you don't need to help Facebook as much when it was just growing on a tear. It's the other ones that, you know, kind of get more of your help. So how many, how many companies, how many portfolio companies were in fund one and fund two, roughly, if you remember, like, uh, fun I mean, so fund one was a smaller fund. So I think we were around about 15 fund two. I think we were around about 30. We, we, we like the idea of 30 because if a third of your companies are going to go to zero, that's 10. If further boring, that's 10. You've got the last third, a third of them or 10% of where your real returns are. It's three companies. Yeah. So really, if you have a portfolio of 30, you're looking to find the three companies out of that that are really going to return the fund. Now, what we try to do is make it four or five companies. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and try to make the losses less of a drag. The The interesting thing about venture, particularly early stage, is um, you on an after-tax basis, you can be generating higher returns on a pre-tax basis for your LPs. So what do I mean by that? Yep. Um, because that, that seems to be the opposite of what the tax code is trying to do. So where you have losses, you get to write those losses off. The LPs get K-1s. And those K-1s losses can offset profits elsewhere. So they're getting value from those losses. When you get to profits, if those profits are qualifying small business stock exempt, profits, QSBS, yeah, QSBS, the federal capital gains tax rate is zero. If, and then lots of provisos, but we try to make those provisos right. The state federal capital gains tax rate could be zero because you're in a zero rate state. Or it can be zero because the state follows the federal rules. For some states like um, New Jersey, for instance, it's not zero and you have to pay capital. But hey, New Jersey is smart. New, New Jersey says, it, 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 and we should just cover this for anyone listening, qualified small business stock, QSBS means if John and I invest in a startup that has under 50 million uh, value on the balance sheet. So value, you're, you're staying away from higher than 50 million valuations, but no, re no, no real estate, no financial services, US Delaware C Corp held over five years. That's right. Then um, up to the higher of $10 million and 10 times your cost base is, is tax exempt. Right. So the first, the first 10 uh, million gain, right. So the first 10 million of gain on a single shot investment and all 30 of your startups could be QSBS qualifying, or if it's 10 X your cost. So whatever you invest in the company. So if you put 5 million in, you pay zero tax on the first 50 million of gain, whatever's the bigger one. So, right. so, so, so you've seen with 15 years play out, you've realized the ones that really pay the big checks you did hold for five years in a day. Right. So the that that's, well, but that's the nature of early stage is you're likely to hold it over five years right the nature of late stage is it's unlikely to have less than 50 million of cash on the balance sheet it's unlikely to be qsbs and you're likely to um exit in sub five years so right. this is this is a, a real value add for tax paying lps and to be and to be clear if it's structured correctly for a lot of founder stock as well yeah, yeah, you know, and and it's important. I, you know, I, I've spoken to um, folks in Washington about this. The VC system is incredibly fragile. Most GPs, most venture capitalists, never see carry. So they they hang around the hoop for the hope that they will see carry, and for, and so this this. Um, tax benefit related to QSB on these investments is really material to keeping VCs around the hoop. Yeah. No, no, I think it's not like and we're going to stop doing it. All but the talent of all the people helping startups. 
Yeah. When you're raising money for the fund is where it's just really important because you're probably not going to go back to whatever you're doing before at Goldman. You're, you're going to keep doing this, but our ability to close people into the next vehicle, the QSBS is, is, is material for sure, which brings me to um, convertible notes and safes versus price rounds because you operate in the early stage. You know, you can blame it on Y Combinator or whoever you want, but there was logical, important reasons for using convertible notes. And there was a logical reason to remove the maturity date, which was the original big feature of the safe note. Um, but when when you're investing in a company and you wire money to them in time zero, and then and it was on a safe note, your five-year stopwatch is not clicking. I've heard people argue that it does start the clock ticking, but I just don't believe that. And I wouldn't attempt to you know, have a liability with the IRS on that. But isn't it true that convertible note, the, the five-year QSBS does not start the clock ticking until uh, a price round happens that triggers conversion to equity? Isn't that right? So, so I think the way I, I feel like we're two non-tax experts uh, discussing this in front of folks. So understand, go and talk to your tax expert. But my understanding is uh, QSBS works when you buy primary stock from the company. A convertible note is not primary stock. Right. Only when it converts, it is. Likewise, you have an option or warrant. It's only once it converts, the clock starts. I've heard people argue that this works for safes, but you know we're not yeah. fans of safes. We don't think they're, they're suitable products for institutional investors. Um, we think accelerators love them because they're kicking off a, the, the more leverage, whether it's through a convertible node or safe, a company can date until it converts means they don't convert their percentage of ownership until the price round. So the longer that the that's delayed, um, the more of a company, Y Combinator or any other accelerator who's promoted this will will get. And, and in reality, whether it's a cap convertible note or cap safe, it's not a valuation. And people can build businesses and get confused so that when you actually have that price round comes comes along, it can be punishing in terms yeah. of the dilution that's taken because you have all of a conversion of the notes um, and safes uh, at a discount to wherever the the price round actually happens. It's like full ratchet anti dilution protection for the safe holders and note holders, as opposed to weighted dilution for equity holders. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, they are dangerous. We think convertible notes' primary place is between two price rounds. Yeah, but if you raise a note round, you really want the next round to be a price round to convert it in. You don't want to do notes followed by notes followed by notes, which which is that, happening. This is why this is why I want to bring it out. Uh, yeah, I want people to hear you and me talk about this because um, you see fifteen million dollar convertible notes. And I'm like, what, you just hate your investors? You're trying to make this really unattractive. Um, there's a lot of problems. The other thing is that um, a price round typically ha has the economics, you know, the valuation, the pre-money valuation, the liquidation preferences and all that. And then there's a whole other side of governance um, that when a lot of these uh, companies are raising money on notes, 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 um, without converting, and they're, the board of directors is like some crypto exchange, two founders on the board. You know, so well, what, I know you're making a reference at the FTX, but look, being a CEO is lonely. You really want your investors sitting around the table, meeting with you once a month, once a quarter, whatever it is, to help you address these issues. Having one person boards or two founder boards, we do not like that. We actually, even at the seed stage, strongly prefer a five person board, yeah. two investors, two common. One person picked by the common, um, not reasonably rejected by the preferred. But and then when you do the next round, you just get one of a preferred off and replace them with one new preferred. We we think that really helps you build a business. Again, we want high survivorship from three or four people to thirty or forty people to you know three to four hundred people. You need that survive. And the, one of the best things you can do is have 
a number of people around the table to talk about all your strategic decisions, the board is a great formalized process to do that in. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, boards of three are not good. Boards of uh, more than more than five are not good. And you know, to, to repeat this, it's two two founders on the board, two of the preferred investors, and one mutually agreed to. Uh, Correct. For, person. I think that's best practice. We always try to get one of our LPs who's an operator in that uh, mutually agreed to uh, position just to have more of that communication so that it's reporting, but it's also uh, having a lot of foresight before anything anything goes wrong. Well, and where do you see, in closing up on, where do you see the um, exit market right now? Or even, you know, if the multiples of the stock market are way down than the multiple of top line revenue. If you get that company to 100 million revenue, is it getting sold for more than 10x or below 10x revenue for the you know enterprise value sell price? Where do you see the economy going? I know I know VCs aren't supposed to be macro guys, but I love every data point I can get. So I I, I apologize. I work with macro guys uh, for quite a period of, of Goldman, so I do have a macro view. Um, uh, so let's start there. Um, we had the longest bull market in forever. Um, you know, I used to tell people we're in year eight of a six year bull market, year 10, year 11, year 12 of a six year bull market. Like that market just ran on. And, you know, the downturn should be very severe. Will it be? I don't know. I've got some friends who think we're going to have three, four years of a bear market in the public markets. Uh, personally, I think it's the middle of this year. There are some people who've called the bottom already, um, which would be very positive for asset managers you know, like ourselves, um, if that's the case. But I, I'm skeptical that we've bottomed already. I think there's another six months of pain. And I think that's going to come because I think corporates are going to miss earnings over the next quarter or two. So up to about the third quarter last year, you have multiple compression. Now, multiples, I think, are, are fine. Now, the thing, the, the thing you're going to see is earning compression. Uh, David Costner at Goldman um, came out recently and said he thinks S&P earnings will be flat 23 over 22. So if startups can generate growth, they should get a premium. Um, when that premium is going to be recognized, I don't know. Uh, but I think... You need a capitulation bottom in public markets. We haven't seen that. With regards to the economy and the like, I think what a lot of people, people get confused when they talk about the economy to think it's one economy. The US economy is a dozen economies. It's the oil economy. It's the property market economy. It's the startup economy. It's the financial services economy, it's the agrarian economy, it's all these different things. At any given point in time, of these dozen economies, I don't know, maybe four in recession and others are booming. And the average of these is the economy. So think of the economy as like an average of an average. It loses a lot of, you know, a lot of information in it. But I think overall, the parts of this economy are incredibly robust and parts which I think are under duress. I suspect property prices will actually be robust because I think there's a dearth of inventory. Now, very market by market, um, but that will preserve wealth for a lot of people. If that's wrong and people feel they've lost a lot of wealth there over time, that will bleed into what people call the real economy where people spend money on a daily basis. But but net net, um, uh, I think it's kind of tough in a lot of places um, across the U.S. And, and decent in other places and good in others. And now trying to blend that down to the bottom line of where it's going to be, it's really tough. We try to invest in businesses that we think are driven not by cyclical factors, but secular factors. And so they should be able to grow, in fact, potentially grow faster when the end market's under duress because they're the low cost, high efficiency solution. Yeah. To you can't afford to do get. this. You can't afford to pay someone a salary that is a higher price point 
for the one year than it is to pay for the software, which does a better job. You know, so right, you can't right. afford I mean, not to use that technology. Right, right. And so, I, you know, I so for, that's from the macro perspective. As I said, multiples come down. Now let's talk about the private markets a little bit. Companies raised so much money in 2021. Yeah. Some were good businesses, and they now probably have enough money to get to profitability. So they've cut costs, and they're looking to get there. Others, maybe bad businesses or maybe businesses on too small amount of revenue, they're going to go out and try and get revenue every which way. So they'll spoil the markets they go into because they will um, bring customers on an uneconomic cost just so they can grow the revenue numbers in a hope that they can raise money later. Right. The so that's, like, that's into giving the customer a hundred bucks for 50 of revenue back. Right. You got it. The the investors into these rounds, they they are just sort of hanging back. They're like, I pay 20 times thinking I was going to sell it 30 times. Now it looks like 10 times. I'm going to just, you know, wait. So there's this standoff. And I, it gets resolved because founders say, you know what? I'm going to raise money at a valuation that is not what I would want but the one I can live with. Or I'll take on terms. It'll look like a flat round, but it'll have structure in it. Um, all that needs to play out. Um, and, and it's difficult to know how that's going to play out. A lot of people think 23 will just be a mixed year. M&A, um, everyone thinks is muted. Mm. But I was talking to someone in a large corporate, and they're like, we've got more in our pipeline than we had last year. Like it's, you know, just a tremendous amount sitting in there. And so when you put all that together, I really don't know how it's going to play out. I don't think anyone knows how it's going to play out. I think the central view is it's going to be tough. There won't be a lot of exits this year. Maybe some will start next year. Um, uh, and the market will probably be challenged. If the market takes off sooner, if things, um, if confidence comes back a little faster, then all that will change. One last point on this. The companies have cut costs enormously. And where they've cut those costs, they, they effectively are leaner. They're going to have taken off on less dilution between last year and next year. And so as investors in there, you may actually end up, even if the company exit at a, a slightly lower price, you may end up with a bigger exit because you took on less dilution in the interim. The, yeah, and the liquidation stack is, is harder to get out from underneath. You've got that. So, John, in my experience, the stock market is real time. You can see immediately the fall in price where you could say, what is the market cap as a multiple of revenue? And then you got startups that were on this, you know, go, go, go market raising around every 12 months with maybe 18 month runways and just constantly going back. And then that real time thing happens and there's a lag. VCs are a little afraid of a markdown or resisting the markdown. And the founder is still trying to raise at a higher valuation and then it starts to compress. So we see a bit of a lag in the private markets responding to the public markets and people thinking of what, you know, to back their way into the return they're looking for. So the late stage guy looking for a 4X to 2X their fund and the early stage guy looking for a 50X, 100X return or minimum 10X. Where do you see us in that lag? Are Have the startups in the private markets when they're raising money from you guys you know, have, have they have they come down or or where do you see that? So I think it's very easy to think that the public markets and the private markets are a continuous extension of each other. And what happens in the public markets is relevant to the private markets in the same way. But it's 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 more complicated than that. So in the public markets, the way you value a stock is basically based on last trade. Last trade may have been 100 shares, 1,000 shares. If there's 100 million shares in a company, 
that's not really the that's not really the value of a company. In fact, when companies get bored, it tends to be at a bid to that. Um, but in reality, that's just where the last share traded in that company. Those, you know, but people think of public market valuations as liquidation valuations, and they're not really. In the private markets, it's never a liquidation value. You know, if I invest in a startup, great company, huge potential, we love it. We're going to put in, you know, half a million dollars, 10% of the company. We love the company. Company's worth zero if I look at liquidation value from the day I invest. Yeah. No one's going to give me that money back. We're making these risk based assessments. And so, you know, unlike hedge funds, we don't get paid on valuations. And so there's only two numbers that matter, the price you get in, the price you get out. And the valuations in between is trying to be your best estimate of where that pathway is. So if you still think the pathway is, is doing well, is it good for you to whip the valuation up and down based on what's happening in a public market on the last trade related to something that may or may not be comparable? doesn't have the growth rate your company has because, you know, in the C stage, your income is going to grow multiple hundred percent year over year. Um, also, in the public markets, you don't expect companies to be raising money every year, every 18 months. So it, they, they're really uh, fish and fowl, you know, apples and lemons. They're just very different in terms of what they mean. And so the, the valuations that you're using really are trying to give an overall sense, and we think at the portfolio level, they're more meaningful than at the stock level, of where things can be. But it's not a liquidation valuation. Yeah. And if you've got, so if you've got companies that are growing 100% year over year, you're generally marking them to the last round. And if they're growing 100% year over year and they don't raise money for two years, you've held them flat. You're not yeah. trying to say, oh, well, I'm going to mark it up because revenues have doubled or right, right. We don't care, know, yeah. margins have expanded, all that kind of stuff. So the valuations for venture are different. Now, if you have institutional LPs that have a portfolio across venture and non-venture, when the public markets come down, they over. really would like you to take down the private markets. Elsewise, it becomes too big a percentage of the portfolio. Right. And so their bias is to lean on their um, venture firms to find ways to mark down the assets so they can allocate more to that asset class. Yeah. But fundamentally, it's, it's, it's really a very involved level three asset with enormous subjectivity. We address it by having a valuation policy that just basically doesn't change. We follow it. We flag impairment in it. Um, and because we, we're not momentum investors as such, um, it stands us in, in good stead. What you found you know, back in 21 is there were a number of companies raising large rounds of large valuations, even before they had to open their doors. Right. Or you had companies with 10 million in revenue raising money at a billion. 100 rate. on 900. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Th those companies are going to suffer because the next round doesn't support that kind of valuation. But we kind of didn't do that. So we're more sitting on the sidelines seeing that. Um, uh, it's all a matter of discipline. And so when the markets get crazy, do you follow on with them or do you get more or do you keep your discipline? And we we tended to keep our discipline. And it frustrates people sometimes. Great company, but the valuation's outside our range. We go, yeah. Yeah. And if we can't get in our range, then we can't. And you know, we'll we'll have to live with that. Yep. Well, your first fund was in an interesting time of 2008. I'm sure that vintage uh, did well and having some austerity and sensibility around valuations and DD probably makes 2023 a good year to be deploying capital in those early stages. If you look at just like inflation growing, um, you better have your money somewhere that is growing at least harder than inflation is. Um, so 
Listen, congratulations on the Ukraine fund, the Polish fund, and continuing the franchise here at home. Hope to see you in some cap tables soon. And sorry you won't be able to make it to our New York event, but you know, invite the FF Venture Capital team to uh, join us that evening, March March 7th. Absolutely will do. And look, thanks for having me on. And uh, um, yeah, th this is an exciting space. There's There's so much ingenuity and new stuff that's happening that's just changing the world and we get the opportunity to to participate in it i think you know you're lucky i'm lucky you know, other folks in this space are lucky to be able to spend our time uh trying to you know work with startups and in our own small way help to change the world uh, there's so much to be optimistic about with uh people making things better so i share i share the same view okay my friend john see you soon bye for now cheers well, that was certainly interesting. It's Mark Dittarjani with Pacific Western Bank back here. Again, really excited to be part of the podcast with 7BC and Andrew. And we're excited just to support the ecosystem and help you get to whatever your next step is in your business journey. Thank you very much.